so it is extremely long hours like i remember the first 3 months every day i used to start at 9 and used to finish at 4:30 5 am in the morning uh, there were instances i when i slept on the floor of the office and for 2 hours and then next day morning just went home took a shower and came back at an analyst at a at a foreign bank you could easily make somewhere around 40 to 70 lakhs associate would definitely be somewhere between 50 to 80 and this is all foreign banks domestic will be definitely much much lower right so you can at least assume a 50 percent haircut to this deals are between two people and you have to satisfy people's egos earlier china was the center point for everybody to invest if they had to look at asia but now i think india became that kind of a hub and i think technology has played a great part change is permanent so unless you are able to adapt to the kind of things that that are happening in the external environment uh, you you cannot you cannot survive तो आज का जो पॉडकास्ट है उसमें हमारे पास एक बहुत ही इंटरेस्टिंग गेस्ट हैं मैं आपसे हिंदी में बात इसीलिए कर रहा हूं क्योंकि मैं कुकू एफएम के ऑफिस में बैठा हूं और हम बात करने वाले हैं एक ऐसे इंसान से जो ये मेक श्योर करते हैं कि कुकू एफएम की बैलेंस शीट ज़्यादा लाल ना दिखे वी आर टॉकिंग टू अनुभव महल हु एक्चुअली इस इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंकर और वॉज एन इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंकर ही हैज स्पेंट अ लॉट ऑफ यर्स अंडरस्टैंडिंग हाउ एम एन ईज वर्क हाउ इन्वेस्टमेंट वर्क हाउ द अदर बिट्स अराउंड द वर्ल्ड ऑफ फाइनेंस वर्क एंड ही हैज गिवन वेरी पॉइंटेड एग्जाम्पल्स एंड स्टोरीज दैट विल मेक यू लर्न मोर अबाउट इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंकिंग इन द वर्ल्ड ऑफ फाइनेंस ही ऑल्सो हैज डेल्प डीपर इन टू द वर्ल्ड ऑफ स्टार्ट अप्स इन टू द वर्ल्ड ऑफ फंडिंग इन द वर्ल्ड ऑफ वॉट मेक्स यू अ बेटर फिट for that industry so definitely is podcast ko pura suniyega aur hame ye bataiyega ki aapke favorite areas in mein se kaun se hain uh, if you are somebody who is interested in the world of finance this podcast is definitely for you the podcast with anubhav mahal starts in 3 2 1 All right uh, as promised i have with me anubhav here with a lot of anubhav uh, <laughs> that he carries on his shoulder uh, anubhav right now we are standing or rather sitting in the kuku fm office in bangalore thank you very much for calling us in and giving us time uh, i know for a fact that you are operating at 2 hours sleep today <laughs> so i am not going to bore you with this conversation i hope that we have a fun filled interactive and learning uh kind of a conversation before i begin the conversation congratulations on another 25 million uh this is a news that i actually saw yesterday yeah. so let's talk about it a little bit how are you guys doing it here no thank you so much and i think uh, for us i think we've always been uh, one thing that i've learned here is that you you don't focus on the funding you focus on the business and the funding and all these kind of events will happen automatically right. let's let's talk about you know when all of this was not that big uh, anubhav you know we all start from zero and probably that's uh, your journey as well what exactly was your childhood growing up i think um, i'm a bit oldy now but i think if you think around 10 15 years back everybody who was like one of the top few students in your class you used to either take engineering or go to medical and then eventually either do continuing coding or if you don't like it you become a uh, and you do an mba and do something else so i graduated in 2006 okay. uh, so good uh, 20 close to like 18 years back mm-hmm. right from nsit in delhi and at that time i was like acha matlab everybody is doing an mba let me also try for a, for a cat exam right okay. and remember first year it didn't work out like i was still around 95 percentile plus okay. uh but it was it didn't work out and then i think when i started working i realized that hey i'm enjoying this let me enjoy this rather than just immediately go for an mba so i worked for 3 years and i think at the end of it i realized that i don't really love coding coding as much but i lo- like the entire it space i like to work with clients try to sell them the what we are propo- proposing and try to build something for them right. so i i thought that okay it might be an mba so there are two paths why do you want to do an mba right a you want to completely change your career path so if you are doing coding you want to do marketing finance something else or you want to basically become a uh, take a higher level up right so you are a junior person giving an mba you basically can become a project leader or something like and that and earn a lot of money 
potentially yeah, that was the intention so i think i wanted to take this kind of path where potential i go for an mba and continue working in it services and then become a project leader project whatever it right become more like a management consultant if that was the intention for me but i think as soon as i uh, and, and and to be honest I, when i gave cat that 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 year that was a i remember very very clearly that was the first year when negative marking came in cat okay. right and i was like i remember i was like everybody teaches yaar ki matlab jana hai to wahan pe sab question karke aane hai right <laughs> so I remember I had I had done that. I was like, okay, I know it's negative marking, but I'm very confident. Like I'm 70% sure. Let me do this, right? And as soon as I came out, everybody's like, typically people used to attempt all 100 questions, and people had not even attempted 40% of them okay. because there was negative marking. And I thought, nahi, yar, maine to I did an 80% questions, and uh, I think that it was just opportunity I got like that kind of percentile, and then eventually cracked uh, all the I am I am uh, interviews, right? So went to IMA, right? But, but I think as soon as you enter. Uh, I just somehow started liking finance more. I think this just was just a coincidence there that okay, hey, I, uh, to, and like my first semester was horrible. Like it was, right. I was not doing like the counting part of things. I could never understand. Like mm. if you think around it, a lot of people uh, get into. I'm like for me working in I uh, in an IT job for three years and then going back to studying. I thought it will be easy, but right. it was not. Right. You have to adapt to a different curriculum. You have to adapt to a different lifestyle completely. Mm. And during that phase, somehow I fell in love in finance, and then that journey started for me. And you said very interestingly that you, when you went there uh, in I am Ahmedabad, your liking for finance increased. So, do you think it happens because you see a lot of these people uh, that probably who you like in the very first instance, and they are probably talking uh, to you in, in in the terms where you know they also like finance, so that mm. that influences you in making a decision because you are still impressionable. Mm. You still are new to the entire ecosystem and the kind of people that you interact with uh, forms the kind of ideas that you right. have about the business world out there because you haven't done it, right? Yeah. Has that happened in your case uh, is the first question. And secondly, how difficult does it become for somebody to change the gears at an age that you were in? Mm. So I think for me, I think if um, I'm obviously talking specifically to IMA, but I think it's common across any kind of B school, right? The, the, the kind of, it basically, it breaks you down and then it basically tries to form you from scratch. I think that's how I, I felt at that time. That like you, obviously you have to focus on the basics, but you have to do it in a very different manner. It has to be a very practical approach. The kind of case studies you do, the kind of interactions you do have, right? But the point was that every day you focus, focus on certain aspects, but then you have a lot of homework, you have to do a lot of background studies. Like there were a lot of, lot of times where I had to put in an all-nighter and then morning 8.45 you have to be in that class, otherwise your right. doors are closed, right? And the profs and everybody is like of such high caliber, the kind of quality that they want you to bring to the class, right? That you also feel a bit of an obligation, ki, I need to put in my 120%, 130%, right? Mm -hmm. So it's somehow, and, and obviously you are in the company of such high performers who have come from different backgrounds, like right? so there are people from arts uh, who, who actually are very great at painting or something. There are guys who have come from BCom, the guys who have come from potentially global schools as well, because these kind of also give you opportunities to connect with a global audience as well, right? right. So, but, but most of them were still engineers, right? A lot of them coming from IITs and other places. But so the competition also brings you up to a certain level. Right. And I think for me, uh, I think your question about finance, how that got triggered, right? It was again more of a coincidence because um, I think when you start looking for internships, uh, what happens is that finance, consulting are the first kind of uh, jobs or interns kind of which come on day zero. At that time it was called day zero, right? Yeah. With the highly coveted kind of uh, things, right? And everybody's vying for those, right? I was just trying to understand what is the job that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Like my motivation of trying to find an internship was what day to day, mein, right? Uh, obviously, the benefits are if you do well, you potentially can get a PPO and all. But mujhe, my, my curiosity was that I have come from this background where I've worked for three years. A lot of the my peers that have directly come from yeah. their undergrad. Um, and this we're I, talking about like two months, three months in, uh, yeah, while yeah, yeah. you are so in the system. You correct, just correct. Walked. Just like I think you start in June, July, and the internships are in November, right? Yeah. And so they have good three, four months. So you obviously have some impression because there is a lot of alumni, a lot of seniors who tell you what you do. But until you get your hands dirty and do that job, you won't really understand and appreciate it. So my point was, let me at least experience what it is, right? What is the high-flying finance kind of jobs that everybody keeps talking about? Whether I like it or not, let's we'll figure it out. Yeah. So that I think that that's what I basically wanted to get into. 
and uh, I think at that time I was fortunate, unfortunate, whichever <laughs> category you want to go at, right? I just got one short list on, on, okay. on day zero, right? Mm. Only one. Right. No consulting, only one investment bank and that too, like I don't know how I managed to get that. And I was the first person to even like went in and cracked it, right? Wow. So, so people like as soon as they came back after 10 minutes of the, because these things they start at some 7 o'clock in the morning, right? That, those days, right? I don't know whether how it, it happens today. So at 7 and 7.15 ish I was out and I had an offer already and people were shocked that how this guy who had just one uh, interview you can crack it. So it was just about again the, my same thinking that don't th figure, don't focus on the outcome, focus on what is at hand and things will fa fall in place if they have to. So I think that's how it, it started and then I think interestingly I actually went into investment banking but on the market side where you basically are trading bonds, looking at global equities, interest rates and doing a bunch of things. So I interned with JP Morgan in Singapore where I spent good two, two and a half months in their office. Um, and this is where you have a lot of traders, a lot of like economists who are sitting together. They are talking about, hey, one interest rate in the US can have oil impact on the price of oil in some other geography. And I was like a little, um, Intimidated. yeah, this, what is, how is this <laughs> going on and what are they talking about? But as in when you keep sitting with them, you keep talking and hearing what they are talking about, right? You you, you are, your economics 101 starts yeah. falling into place. Yeah. Ki I think what we were taught, there is a practical implication of that. There is obviously uh, also price, uh, supply and demand. But yes, it was something which was, I really felt like, yes, this is something. You, you feel your uh, blood pumping here. This guy is putting $1 million worth of uh, interest rate futures and can this will impact have that, right? So it was something which was very, very real for me, which yeah. I could like, Sit some sitting next to somebody who's actually doing all these kind of transactions. But I think at the end of it, I felt that I was not made for it. Like in the sense that it was more of a, uh, somebody who had to do a lot of brainstorming in terms of looking at all those uh, interest rate environments, talking about like economics and a bunch of things and, and just sitting there and doing that for like some eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. And then obviously it's a great lifestyle. It's a good, good way to earn money. You like finish a job at five, then you are off, you can go to gym, go to your family, and then again you start day on right, the next day, right? right? But I think for me, it was always important to get deeper and deeper into how companies work, how corporates work. It was something which which really fascinated me. I think once I came back from the internship, I was very sure I don't want to get into the trading side of things. But that interest in finance had, had suddenly uh, kicked in for right. me. So I think the second year I was completely focusing on some of those aspects on how investment banking, balance sheet and those kind of things work. And fortunately again in the finals uh, placements I got a job through UBS Investment Banking. Tell me uh, one of um, the first time when you heard about investment banking and after two years when you got all these experiences and now you're placed with UBS, what was your idea about investment banking? before and what is the idea after uh, you know the two years that you have spent was mm -hmm. and how did that uh, transform you as an individual? No, I think I, at, at the time when I got into IM, I had no clue what investment banking is. I just knew that okay, hey, this is something in finance, you potentially trade and there's, there's these kind of advisors which are there who help companies in a certain manner, right? Uh, but to be honest, I was not very sure what happens, right? And I, I remember one of my friends who had spent two, three years in investment banking, she had told me that it's, it's, it's not as complicated as, as you think uh, and you just need to stick to the basics and you'll figure it out. I think that was the basic simple thing that she told me, right? Um, I think at the end of it, uh, when, I, when, I, when I was about to join UBS, again, I had very little idea because I had interned on a different side of right. investment banking. Right. But again, some of my friends who had interned with it on the in the investment banking side, they told me that it's very very harsh. Mm. Like it's extremely long hours. You need to look at like you have to continue only focus on Excel sheet and PowerPoint, and there's nothing else. I remember I used to go for lunch in my internship at like one o'clock in the afternoon, and there is another friend of mine who half the time could not turn up, yeah. right? Because he was like, I need to complete this this deck, right? So when I went into investment banking, I was like again trying to see here what is going on, how things move. And then there are other guys who have spent some time on the in, on the internship and they're already, when they came in, they are prepared. That, okay, ye, this is the daily job that you have to do. This is how you have to interact with people. Uh, and I initially struggled because a lot of times initially, like as an analyst in investment banking, I think your job is to just make sure that whatever deck presentation Excel sheet comes to you, you deliver it in time. Yeah. So it is extremely long hours. Like I remember the first three months, every day I used to start at nine and used to finish at 4.30, 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, there were instances I when I slept on the floor of the office 
and for two hours and then next day morning just went home to Kashar and came back. Like the, those were the kind of days and initially like you, like, you obviously I did not know the tricks of the trade. Here Excel may if you have to put in some numbers, this is the best way to do it or in a PowerPoint if you make a presentation, yeah, exactly. So this is the way, these are the kind of shortcuts that you should do, right? So I had to spend like majority of time making sure, rectifying those kind of small, small errors here and there. And when you are obviously working with a, a prestigious kind of an institution, the kind of expectations from you are, are dramatically very, 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 very high, right? So that they expect, hey, this person will learn on the job, but this is what I expect out of him, mm -hmm. right? That this person is available 24/7. Uh, if I have a, if I have a climb, if they have a climb meeting next day, this person will be able to turn around things overnight. Right. Absolutely, and that's what uh, I was going to ask you. That mm -hmm. you think that that's where your journey of telling stories through numbers started, because yeah. you know you're seeing numbers for hours and hours, yeah. and then you have to make sense of it for others to see it, right? right. And that probably is the entry to the door mm. of uh, an investment banker as well because he has to make sure or she has to make sure that both the parties understand and come together uh, on a table and sign a deal, right? Uh, we were talking about prestigious companies and uh, you switched to one of these prestigious companies which is BNP Paribas and you had three roles possibly and this is what you have written in your LinkedIn. Uh, one is of an analyst where you start, yeah. one is of an associate and the other one is right. when you yeah, when you retire or not retired, when you quit the organization as a VP, right? So let's talk about these three. As an analyst, what do you do in a BNP Paribas? What happens when you become an associate? And what happens when you become a VP in right. a company like it? Yeah. So I think um, investment banking typically teams like like are pretty pretty small, right? It's very very well oiled small teams, and every deal you'll have like only three to four people, right? So while you have a the typical hierarchy would be like there is a managing director or a, a managing partner if you want to call it and then there is a ED or a VP and then there is an associate and then there is an analyst. That's how typically this will flow. Any deal any deal you will have at least a VP who is overlooking it, an associate and an analyst, right? And at one point in time analyst will could be working on three, four deals, okay. pitches at the same time. But we, the job of the VP is to oversee the entire kind of role. So as you progress over the organization your role obviously keeps changing, right? Uh, typically, the analyst kind of program is like two to three years in every kind of investment bank. Then you graduate towards an associate where you spend again two to three years. And then depending on how good you're doing, you basically become a vice president. At an analyst at a, at a foreign bank, you could easily make somewhere around 40 to 70 lakhs uh, for the first two years, in like every year, right? That's the kind of thing because there is a fixed component and there's a variable component which is dependent, completely dependent on the your performance and the firm's performance. That's an analyst level. Associate would definitely be somewhere between 50 to 80. Yeah. And this is all foreign banks. Domestic will be definitely much, much lower, right? So you can at least assume a 50% haircut to this. VP again depends. Uh, it can be 70 to 1.2. And then I think for MDs, it can it can be varying from 1 to okay. 5, depending on again how it is, right? So it's it can be very, very wide. But obviously, the guys in the American investment banks uh, have a very different scale altogether. Mm. Right. So at an analyst level, I think it's the, the first step into the door, right? There, I think the intention is that you, first of all, are in charge of looking at the entire financial models, uh, the PowerPoint decks that you have to make, uh, and you have to spend maximum amount of time in, in the office, right? That, that you have to make sure you have to review the models, you have to keep the basically building everything from scratch, yeah. and then the entire deck. Uh, and then you have an associate who is basically overseeing some part of your work, right? And both of you have to work together to give out an output to the VP, yeah. right? And VP obviously will review the entire presentation, look at how the uh, the deck is flowing, whether it is flowing in line or not, whether it is as per the expectations of the of the managing director and also the client, because um, typically analysts uh, may or may not go to all meetings, associate should go to all meetings, but VP and MD will go, definitely go to all the meetings. Right. Right, so they are the closest to the client. Mm -hmm. Idea is that they need to understand the pulse of both the market mm -hmm. as well as what the the, the client wants uh, for, to achieve. Right, whether right. through an M&A, whether through taking the company public, whichever kind of, kind of deal you are working on. But they understand that kind of pulse, and they are trying to get the kind of key kind of messages going in the presentation. And also, from a number standpoint, they they have to look at make sure that the numbers are all all like. Uh, to the T, right? In some manner, right? So there's no mistake. The the formatting is good. The numbers, the the valuation, everything is as per what you should be doing, right? So so most of the time, the the overnighters and the kind of detail-oriented work is done by the analysts and the associates and the vice VPs and all 
uh, they have the most client interaction. So they have to present to the client, they have to travel a lot, they have to do both the jobs of finding new business and also making sure that existing deals get executed. Right. right? So till you are an analyst and associate, the pressure of getting new business is not on you. Mm -hmm. If you can get it, great. Uh, but the idea is that you have to focus on something which is uh, which the managing director and the and the vice president are getting from a business side of you and also the pitches and all. Uh, but the pressure of new business, so you don't have a PNL or a sales target on your head. But as you obviously graduate in an organization, those kind of things start uh, populating for you. Great. I think that's that's very valuable information for a lot of. Uh freshers who are interested in this kind of a uh, space. Uh, let's move on to some of the stories because you know you are in the storytelling business, we are in the storytelling business and it's incomplete to understand any sector or any particular role without stories. So tell me one such story that you remember that included Indian clients mm -hmm. and one, one particular story that included uh, any Western client for that matter that you still remember, still cherish because of the kind of things that you had to go through and the kind of results that you've gotten? No, I think every every kind of deal has its own uh, nuances to it, had its own uh, flavors to it, right? Because uh, I think I think one thing that I've always learned, which which I think was a big learning from me from investment banking, that you have to know your audience. Like if, if the audience is a CEO of a large company who's very strong with numbers, you have to make sure your deck and everything is very, very tight on numbers. But the other thing is that if there is a person who is more of a storyteller and wants to just look at the bigger picture, then you have to talk in that sense, right? So I remember one of the instances uh, where, um, uh, and and this is a this is a very peculiar Indian kind of situation. Not many people understand, right? That um, while 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 I think the a lot of the Americans and Europeans are very hardcore number guys, like on the corporate side, that they will go deep into what side of numbers, how they look at valuation. Indians are more feel yeah. like that they that so for example you go in a meeting and you start talking about numbers and then they'll start talk, saying ki unnis bis theek lag raha hai yeah. right so unnis bis i remember there was one, one colleague of mine he was he he was from south india so he could not understand um, hindi that well and we went to meet a client in kolkata and that person is uh, talking in like some uh, like very very hindi you know, like very fluent hindi and mm -hmm. he's not able to understand but every few seconds this person will say unnis bis mm -hmm. Right, so then this guy he starts everything that he th he, th he thinks that okay, unus bees is slang for that this guy is using. So then he starts using unus bees, right? He's like, sir, number is like hundred hundred cr, but unus bees ho jayega. <laughs> so this guy then the client is starting here. What are you talking about? What unus bees are you referring to? So that was a situation where you had to tell him that please hold off. <laughs> you don't understand the language. So that kind of language peculiarities also happen. And there was one deal where which was a. Uh, a European company trying to look uh, uh, acquire something in India and typically you have these processes where you have like eminent deals where there's a seller and there's a buyer and seller looks at talking to a multiple set of investors or buyers right mm -hmm. so that's like an auction kind of a process but sometimes you have something where the buyer and seller are both agreeable that we should do a deal together which is like a bilateral deal mm -hmm. but those the challenge with bilateral deal is that there is no timeline there is no um, set Right here, I mean, everybody's at their own nuance that we'll do a deal casually, yeah, right? Yeah. So there was one of my first deals that I did where a European client was looking to buy a company in India. And the Indian team and the Indian company was like a very promoter driven family business. Mm. So they, they put a value on the business and they said, Achha, theek hai, we make sense. But then after three weeks, they'll come back, Nahi, we need 50 CR more, uh. right? And these guys, the Europeans are like, what are you talking about? Like we believe in EPS, like earnings per share and you are, uh, talking about some random thing, so then talks got stalled. Then again, they will come back in. We see a huge potential in India. Let's uh, we are okay with their 50 CR extra. And then everybody come back to the table. And then uh, again, these guys, Indian families being Indian families, they are like, I need 100 CR more because this is what has happened. The business has gone to a turn. So every six months, this issue happened. That deal took good two two and a half years to close. And I was the analyst who was like running numbers every six months. <laughs> something has happened and the numbers have gone up. I don't know why. Right. The valuation numbers have gone up. So I remember uh, uh, this is a final negotiating table, right? And there's a European sitting and there's an Indian founder sitting, right? And they could not agree on something. And uh, like five o'clock, they both went to the rooms and said, that deal is off. It's not happening. And then I remember my uh, my boss, my MD, right? He he obviously was a very hardcore numbers guy, but he also knew the the emotional side of things, right? That okay, deals are between two people, and you have to satisfy people's egos. Right. 
So then basically in the middle of the night, he called us and he said, okay, I want you to write a letter on behalf of the seller that, uh, or, sorry, on behalf of the buyer, because we were on the buy side that then, that okay, we understand these are your, uh, um, like these are your limitations, these are the value and we'll work together in a certain manner. So it was a very less numbers, but more emotional kind of a letter that we want to work on this, but this, you can't keep change, uh, changing things that way, right? right? And then in the middle of the light, the letter went from the buyer to the seller and in the morning the seller was back on the table, mm. right? And it was very interesting that it was not about, uh, like the deals are not about numbers all the time. It's right. all about two people. You have to obviously make sure that their ambitions, their aspirations are achieved in certain manner and but their egos are also satisfied, right? right. Because these are big, uh, big boys who are on the table, right? So I think those kind of situations are, um, they, I think they are always there. Before we move on from uh, investment banking, let's talk about a few resources that you refer sure. to regularly yeah. when it comes to investment banking and somebody who wants to get in and understand this a little better, what should they be reading? No, I think um, uh, it's always it, it's always best if you can find a good internship in because that will give you the real flavor of the job. But I think you should be very much uh, firstly aware about the the key financial terms, right? So you should, you need to have your, um, either you are good at accounting or at least you need to be good with numbers. Yeah. That is very important. Yeah. Then I think you need to have a good sense of what is happening in the in the market, right? So Economic Times or uh, Mint or any of those kind of public uh, newspapers which are there, like Inside I Am, some of the other kind of publications which talk about how, how finance works, right? I think those are important kind of pillars that you need to have. Uh, but you should also know about the deals that are happening in the market, right? So there are like, uh, like obviously these, these are very high end kind of pub publications. The Bloomberg is a great thing which talks about a lot of numbers on companies, yeah. right? Then you have uh, a lot of these uh, deals Asia, a lot of these kind of New York Times, a lot of these FT Financial Times, right? A lot of those kind of publications give you in-depth analysis of how a lot of m &A, uh, deals have worked, right? So it gives you a flavor of the kind of synergies, why deals happen, what what, what drives people to do m and right? So I think that can give you some flavor about it, but I think the best thing would always be to just try to get an internship because the real world could be very, very different from what you are reading in a, in a paper. Right, and that's probably what happened to you as well because you did an internship yes. in a kind of a place where you thought something and then you realized mm -hmm. that it's something else and right. then you course corrected to getting into something that you probably like exactly. or wanted. Yeah. And that's that's probably a very valuable information for uh, a lot of people who are looking to get into a field like this. Let's now talk a little bit about your decision to quit investment banking. Mm -hmm. At what point do you feel that you know you have reached a level where there is there is a stop button that you need to press in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's because you're burnt out, whether it's because you want to take new challenges, whether it's because you know you see that there is not much to learn from a particular place. When do you know that it's time to stop? I think one of the things that I've always realized in my life is that the only constant in, in life is change, right? I think having worked in investment banking for eight years, I knew the skills of the trade that this is happening and this is this is how an IPO works, this is how an M&A deal works, right? But at some point in time, um, large corporations and even investment banks are large corporations where everything is a is a hierarchy driven and everything is a step function that okay you do this then you achieve this there is a lot of politics going on but at the end of it every job that you do is a, is a marketing job it's a sales job right you need to either selling sell yourself as a person or you're selling a product right or it's a service right yeah. so marketing is I think the one of the key skills that anybody should have whether you before even learning finance right mm -hmm. so I realized very soon that in investment banking that uh, there is a certain path set for me that if I work in five years as or three years as the VP, I can become uh, an AVP or a, sorry an SVP and then potentially become an MD, right? But I think I I realize that what I what I what do I enjoy in this entire exercise? I realize that meeting clients, talking to companies, understanding how they work is something I really uh, really enjoy a lot. And also the other aspect was that for investment banking side, we are always on the fence that you are advising people, you're telling them how M&A works. Once you do the deal, then you move on to the next deal, yeah. right? But for me, what was important was how does how did the deal uh, happen? Uh, how did the deal uh, perform after yeah. it happened, right? Mm -hmm. So I decided that, hey, I think I have spent good amount of time honing this skill set. Let me get on the other side and learn something new things mm -hmm. because I think it's always important for me to learn new things and, in, and that is what I enjoy most. Yeah. If I'm not learning or or doing something interesting, I just get bored out of it. That's just me, 
Um, so I decided in back in 2019 that hey, it's been eight years. Let me use that knowledge to go to the corporate side, yeah. and uh, potentially I can use that knowledge to uh, bring some good capital efficiencies if some possible, but also learn what happens after you do an M&A or or how do you decide that yes, I need to do an M&A and what is the impact on the both the buyer and seller after that M&A yeah. happens. So yeah. that's when I decided to go to the corporate side. Okay, so you have seen a lot of uh, these M&As and you've been part of some of probably very big deals that we can't disclose right now for obvious reasons. But uh, let, let's talk about the funding space in India right now. How do you see that space changing in the last four or five years that you have stopped working in an investment bank? Mm -hmm. What exactly do you think has changed over this particular period? Do you think that any significant change has happened because of the technology or the involvement of uh, a lot of new people coming into the system or do you think we are going back in time when things were in a certain kind? No, I think um, I think the good thing that you've seen over the last six, seven years is that a lot of new companies started coming, like startups are coming up. If you think around um, eight, nine, ten years back, I would have only heard about like one or two startups forming yeah. from India which are achieving scale. Mm -hmm. But now I think people, uh, what has happened is the the from a from a consumer sorry from a youth standpoint, people are willing to take those kind of risk, right? And mm -hmm. back in my day, the aspirations were limited to becoming a doctor or an engineer or or going down a government path route, right? Yeah. Now I think um, with a lot of the information coming in, the geo wave coming in, like and a lot of things, people's aspirations have changed. People want to take that risk. People are okay to give it, give it a shot, and then see okay, if there isn't didn't work out, then I can do something else, right? Yeah. Which was not the case when I was studying, right? Everybody had a set path. Startups coming in, a lot of attention started coming in to the Indian ecosystem by the the VCs and the and the pro capital providers, as you yeah. want to call it, yeah. right? Which which at least gave people the assur assurance that hey, I don't need to really um, work without a salary or work without uh, my, put in my own money for the longest time. There are people who will help me in this entire journey, right? That that amount of confidence when you see one or two success stories, everybody started getting uh, pulled into it, right? Which is which has I think really really a great story for India because uh, one of the key things that started happening up uh, I think at good four or five years back was that a lot of people started focusing away from China. Like I, earlier China was the center point for everybody to invest. If they had to look at Asia, China was one place that everybody wanted to spend uh, time in, time and resources in. But now I think India became that kind of a hub. And I think technology has played a great part, right? Indians have always been very motivated to, uh, on, on technology, math, very good with languages, and that kind of things you don't find in China, right? Yeah. From a language standpoint, Indians are much more palatable to speak in English than versus uh, the Chinese, right? Correct. So I think those kind of key things in terms of having the right kind of uh, access to technology, the, your demographic dividend, and people being strong in tech languages really helped a lot of global companies to set shop in India, then start, then the capital providers started coming in and then started funding a lot of these uh, small ventures, right? And people, like then the risk taking attitude just dramatically changed. It's great that we are talking about startups while being at the startup capital. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that too, oh, in the office that mm. is in startup that is making strides now. Let's talk about funding a little uh, bit in detail as to how it works. So for example, for a startup, what is the step one for it to raise capital. How does a particular startup know that it's ready for a funding round? And how do people who are willing to put money understand that this particular startup has potential and we should back it up? Right. So I think different. there are different stages of a startup, right? There could be a, an early stage startup, there is a growth stage startup, and then there's a late stage startup, right? So the dynamics are very, very different in all the three stages. Um, at, at the very early stage where you say a, a seed or a pre-seed or those kind of rounds where it's where it's an idea of the founders right the of the of the individual that hey this is what we want to this is the problem we want to solve this is how we want to solve it and this is the potential market which is available so it's at that time you don't have a lot of uh, concrete evidence that yes this is something that uh, we will be able to achieve or maybe or maybe you have launched something and you've seen very very early positive signs right so at that time it's more about the storytelling what uh, what what is the problem you're solving and why why you're so passionate about it because from an investor side they are trying to see whether are you somebody who will dedicate 10 to 15 years of your life towards solving this problem okay. that's the key indicator and for that they may see what background you may have whether you're coming from some uh, somewhere where you have managed a team 
or how committed you are from a, from an idea perspective and do you have the operational expertise or at least the expertise to hire people who have the operational right. expertise right mm -hmm. i think those are the key indicators uh, that people or at a, at a or a vc look at right a lot of people may have a very different view ki hey this is a very small industry i don't see a big outcome coming in or some people may just say hey i think this is a great idea you may not be the largest player uh, that will develop it but this could be a good business mm -hmm. to build it right so it's all about the founder's vision and the and the storytelling the storytelling and the mission and may or may not have remained the same that you started with it may have pivoted and right. you've done something else but still it is always about the vision what you're trying to build in but there at least the idea is that you have achieved pmf or a product market fit and then the story is also collaborated with the kind of numbers that you can show from a from either it is revenues or the kind of users who have downloaded or the monetization that you've achieved or the kind of margins you the, the unit economics right it's all about yeah. the unit economics that uh, falls into picture and then it's the late stage mm -hmm. where where you're saying that hey i am at i've already set a business i have disrupted this market and uh, i i could ideally go for an ipo or i can find a strategic who can buy this uh, but this is a business which is set i just need the capital for purely purely for growth and making sure that i achieve profitability so i think one has to be very clear at what stage you are in and uh, why you want to raise um and i think i guess once you are clear on that then 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 you can work backwards mm. to to do the next kind of steps whether you want to reach out to vcs or you want to prepare a data room and those kind of different aspects come into picture do you think uh, the startups most of the startups in india they more of storytellers or doers so i think you have to be a combination um matlab there could be a situation where like in a good market you you can be the storyteller and you can get loads of funding right but but eventually you have to think around uh, investors so you have not have to think around capital you have to think around whether this kind of a partner if i bring on board they will be asking me a lot of questions they will be i am responsible to them yeah. right if i am responsible to them i can't i it can just it, it cannot be just storytelling there has to be fundamental business uh, potentially to be built or already built okay. and it's only then um, uh that the people will be willing to believe you the, you should not think about a startup being only like a 3 4 5 year journey right you have to you have to be committed to the idea because for example for me also there was a stage where i was contemplating but then i realized that hey i have not found a compelling idea where i can dedicate 10 to 15 years of my life to that idea Correct. right so i think you need to be that strong willed that hey i want to spend the next decade doing this right and and with the people that um, uh i want to do this with so i think that's where i think every every external stakeholder whether it is your investor your client or for that matter anybody they will look at those kind of things for you so you can be good storytellers but i think um you have to be good with execution so uh, anubhav um, you actually have given a lot of advice with again uh, pardon my word play with your anubhav uh, <laughs> and uh, you have given a lot of advice to these startups as well with respect to when they should probably get into the entire uh, deal of funding when they should be raising money where they should be focusing on certain elements in their business to grow right what probably would be your advice to an early stage startup growth or profitability right i think i think at an early stage i think you have to focus only on growth because it's all about finding the right product market fit uh for a startup profitability question comes in once at a much later stage when you know that there is demand for your product but first to establish that demand you have to focus on growth mm -hmm. at at maybe a growth at a, when you are at a growth stage or a, at a late stage then i think the questions on profitability are much more important so i think just to give you an example right if you think around kuku fm right so um maybe maybe 2 years back when we started monetization i think uh, for the last uh Uh, early till earlier this year we were completely focused on growth mm -hmm. because we we were the like the kind of a very uh, a player who's focused only on audio we are trying to become the largest uh, audio platform in india uh, and i think it was important to establish to the market that hey this this is the product that people want yeah. and to even to us right so once you have achieved that product market fit that there is a demand for this kind of a product uh, only then you should start focusing on other metrics obviously the intention is you are not burning a lot of money mm -hmm. but growth is the key fundamental principle that it is important for the company and for any external stakeholder right because right. that's where it shows that yes uh, there is a customer who's willing to pay for it 
once you have established that you have established a good business model what are your potential margins how do you acquire a customer what are your key gro- uh, acquisition channels what are your growth growth channels mm-hmm. i think then it's time to focus on the next stage where you are looking at uh, some sort of profitability it should not be, it may or may not be netting the profitability but at a gross gross margin level or at a contribution margin level like or like just before marketing after marketing are you profitable because that gives a sign that on, on a unit basis the company or a or a platform is profitable or not mm-hmm. and i think as you start growing significantly um it is then to prove to yourself that can i make this business a much larger kind of business where you are not dependent on external capital so today at kuku fm i think we we are at that stage where we where we want to achieve that profitability much sooner right we we are comfortable with the amount of money that we have raised we know that we have a much long uh, uh, runway for us but we want to make sure that the company is growing every every rupee that is spent there is profitability attached to it so that's how the entire um, the entire um, the company is being built that's what people are thinking about that's the kind of ethos that we want to build for the company today that hey we want to want to focus on we w- we would not deprioritize growth but we want to become a profitable company much sooner okay what is the flip side of raising money so i think the kind of expectations that come up right uh, a lot of times uh, it depends again on the stage of the business and external environment but people have those kind of ambitions that hey you have raised so much money you need to show mm. x amount of growth every month right um i think one thing at kuku ham we are very much focused on is that we have to have to build a business mm-hmm. it should not be that there have been situations and you keep reading them in the press that people are just throwing money out for marketing yeah. or just giving hugely dis- uh, discounting uh, hugely discounting discount, uh, discounts on products and eventually there is no unit economics there is just pure vc money coming in and going to customers right and, and i think that does that can give you short term growth but after a point of time there is no business everybody can see through so i think raising capital is a big responsibility because you are tr- you are putting your uh, you are take basically putting uh, the trust of somebody in your own hands and you are basically showing to the world hey i have i have done this i'll make sure i have made those kind of promises to you in terms of t- scaling this business but also making sure that i'll achieve my key kpis and let's be the partners together and grow this business right, right. great lovely uh, let, let's talk about your decision to uh, you know join kuku uh, you probably have worked with the top 1% uh, when you graduated from uh, you know your prestigious institute and right now you are serving an audience that probably belongs to the the rest of the 90% that a lot of companies don't even want to touch right because we're talking about the bharat we're talking about people who belong to tier 3 tier 4 cities and villages and uh for obvious reasons a lot of companies don't want to spend their bucks there because the return it seems is a bit lower what was your math that told you that probably here is a big opportunity for you yeah no i think at kuku fm we are we are very much committed to the bharat of india right i think yeah, there is a lot of talk about this india one india two where like only the top uh, 50 to 75 million indians are where every like every e-commerce player every kind of startup wants to focus on that because that those are the highly monetizable kind of an audience right but then i think for us what was very important is that we are we want to make it a mass market product mm-hmm. we we understand that um there are two things that everybody like every indian has always spent money on one is so- social status that marriages or birthdays and everything and second is education or upskilling or gaining knowledge right and i think we are, we are focused on that particular segment we know that if you have if you have the right product if people understand what you're selling and they appreciate what you're selling they will definitely pay and we have like 2.5 million subscribers to show for that right that hey like more than i think 65 70% of our subscribers are coming from tier 2 and beyond mm-hmm. but they have like they spend around 200 rupees every month mm-hmm. on recharging their phones right yeah. so they can easily spend uh, the subscription amount that we are asking for to uh, learn new things become better version of themselves or to just uh, uh, become a, like just gain knowledge right? mm-hmm. i think that's uh, that's where i think we are focused on because as indians i think it's very much easy to um like india is called the dauma of factories of the world right where everybody if they have to show high numbers they just sell their product for free and right. everybody is spending a lot of time right but if you have to really add value to their lives and make sure that they are paying for you you have to bring a product that they 
can attach most value to and that's where i think we are more focused on that's why today we do not have english on the platform we are focused on seven vernacular languages uh, hindi tamil telugu malayalam kannada marathi and bengali uh, and i think because we want to focus on that audience which has given us so much love and they are willing to spend more and more on us right i think and we'll find ways in which we can uh, bring them a better product as we continue to grow right but on the uh, contrary i mean uh, what i think is indian audience or people that you are dealing with uh, they are very cautious about where they are spending their money yes. right and even if you are asking for 100 rupees 200 rupees they'll question the kind of value that you are giving them and that is pretty evident by uh, what we are seeing probably uh, with players like uh, netflix or hotstar who go by the subscription model okay. and in india probably it's it's definitely very very hard for this particular segment to believe in the subscription model do you think that this is going to be a bigger challenge when you start scaling up from here where you are right now and do you yourself as somebody who looks after finance take these decisions as to where the capping should be in terms of the subscription value that you are charging from people no i think um, again just to come back to that core point right that if you are selling a service that people want and willing to pay for it i think uh, that's the kind of success you want i think that's why our product is designed in a way that it's it's very easy to use the kind of content which is on the platform is also designed for the kind of audience right if you think around netflix hotstar when they started it was completely bringing english content to the india to india right where it was uh, the stories were much more western in nature people yeah. could not relate to it yeah. maybe the top 10 15 million people could uh, relate to it and hotstar for that matter focused on cricket for the longest time right but now you see a lot of vernacular stories coming in now you can see a lot of them focusing on the indian stories behind it um, and that's where they have started found finding some success i think for us again like for example we the some of the content pieces are very much attuned to india what we do is we bring uh, like the kind of audio books that we have globally but we bring with an indian uh, background or a connotation right which really helps people understand what they are dealing with right Uh, so i think you have to you have to customize as per your audience bring them the kind of um, value prop that you can and then people will love you right i think indians are very value conscious yeah. that's very that everybody knows right but yeah. i think indians have always been willing to spend money where they can get maximum value out of it and that's and once you have achieved that kind of a sweet spot i think people will always appreciate uh what you bring to the table all right uh, do you look at the pnl of your company yeah. at this point in time uh you know it's it's one thing to raise capital mm-hmm. it's one thing to raise funds and it's on the other hand you have to make sure that you are spending it consciously yes. right uh what is your strategy if i have to ask you in the next 4 5 years uh, that you see making some changes probably that is needed to make sure that the red line uh actually disappears no i think um, every business once it achieves a certain scale there is a bit of an operating leverage that kicks in and right? operating leverage where you have um, like for example a lot of startups the biggest uh, cost item is marketing right because you have to go and acquire your users you have to yeah. build that brand people need to know that what their uh, company stands for i think at a certain level once you st- once you have achieved that scale i think you realize that hey i can i don't need to spend so much on marketing i mm-hmm. my my potentially my for example my cacs have come started coming down right and i think i think it's always about budgeting for the change right it's all about all about that hey making sure that every team has their budget and stick to that budget if they are not you need to be very very clear why you're not able to budget, achieve that budget right so it's if you start believing that the money is yours then you will spend it a lot right you have to, if you have to believe that this is the money of the investors this is the money of your partners and you have to be very very prudent about every rupee being spent right so i think for us uh what we are tr- trying to be as tight on financial planning make sure that uh the growth is not does not suffer but there are other items there are other inefficiencies that we can eliminate in the system uh from uh getting a better deal from some of our partners getting a better deal from some of our vendors or just making sure that the technology that we have they have implemented that becomes better and better so that uh automatic the platform scales much faster a lot of uh, founders probably would be envious to you right now because they probably have gone through this winter that we all have spoken about uh, for quite a few months and uh they probably are looking at your figure and uh, thinking that how the hell are they doing it right at this point in time how do you see that 
winter to be is it going to be chiller uh, is it uh, going to be you know subsiding in some months do you think that india is already back on track mm -hmm. when it comes to getting money from outside and pulling it in for the growth of the companies and how good is this a space for a probable student who is probably watching us right now talking about it yeah no, I think I think good businesses will always um, get the amount of capital that they need, right? So it's if you are building a solid business, thinking business first, taking those strong decisions, which which may be harsh in the short term, but will be good in the long term. I think, uh, as I said, right, capital is a, is going to be an outcome. The cattle you raise, it's always about the inputs that you make in the business. If you are making a sustainable business, it will attract the right sort of partners for you to uh, to raise capital. While I think while 2021 was a crazy year. It was an outlandish year where people were raising crazy amount of capital. Yeah. I think uh, this kind of a winter is good because it brings some sanity to the entire ecosystem, right? You have founders who were, whose expectations were like way out of order uh, two years back, but now they understand that hey, um, is this a space? Uh, how should I build in this space? So I think it's a good time to build because there's a lot of patient capital waiting on the side who are who's ready to back the right kind of founders, right? I think. I think, uh, and I think we're already seeing signs uh, that the that people are willing to bet. I think there have been multiple announcements happening over the last one month, and so yeah. I think I think we should be back to uh, a good level of of this funding, uh, maybe by Q1 of next year. Whether we go back to 21, 21 days, I think that's not the case because that was a case of really low interest rate environment. I don't think that's coming up very soon. But I think what has helped is that now people are spending more time on diligence. People are more spending more time on numbers, understanding the product. While earlier people were just trying to sign deals in two, three weeks, right? right. So I think it's a good space to be. Uh, and if anybody who wants to start up has a good problem that they want to solve with and they are very, very much committed. I think there is enough and more kind of people who are willing to fund it. All right. So keeping that in mind that the winter is not going to stay for long, uh, which are the, probably the areas or the startups or the industries that you probably are seeing taking in a lot of people because there has been a lot of layoffs lately that has happened uh, and which are the ones that probably will stand the test of the time? Right. No, I think um, if you think around it, there have been, if you're looking at pure capital de deployment kind of situation, I think you would have seen those kind of trends which keep coming. Like last year it was crypto, this year it's yeah. generative AI, right? Yeah. But I think, um, so it's it's always about finding, I, I think it's not about the, the the industry and some of these things are secondary in match manner. First thing foremost is always about the, the founders and the team that you have to work with. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that every startup, corporate or any kind of place, it's always about the people. Yeah. So one should spend a lot of time understanding what drives the founders, what is their vision, how are they implementing it, uh, and you should speak to as many people in the company or some of the previous uh, companies that they have worked to understand what motivates the people. Because on a day-to-day -day level, it is the closest to the team that you will do, right? Yeah. A lot of people are excited about the generative AI. I think people have seen the kind of trends that, uh, the kind of, um, uh, efficiencies that generative AI can bring in, what, what all it can do, I think it's something that is there for stay, right? Mm -hmm. Whether uh, the, the talk about AI eating jobs and everything, I think I think is a little over the top, but it will definitely have an impact on the kind of jobs you'll do in the future. Whether you'll do a lot of manual kind of jobs or some high tech kind of jobs and what sort of skills that you need to get those jobs, I think that is something which is here to stay. Uh, whether it will be will happening over three years, five years, 10 years, is I think anybody's guess today. Okay. Uh, but I think, uh, and and I think another thing that that I am personally very passionate about is is climate tech and uh, space tech, okay. right? I think those are some of the things where you will see a lot of innovations happening, and you need a lot of capital and innovations to happen for us as a species to survive, right? There's a there's a lot of uh, lot of uh, things that need to happen in today's world. I think people are a lot investors are more focused on SaaS and B two B and all because B, traditionally all B two C businesses require a lot of capital because you have to acquire each and every customer uh, and it requires a lot of capital. So I think uh, that's why you've seen over the last 12 months, more capital has gone into B2B versus B2B, B2C. Okay. But I think again, it's always about the fundamentals of the business. If the fundamentals of business are strong and you have the right set of people, I think uh, capital again is an outcome. Let, let's talk about uh, certain failures or certain things that you probably think and look back and say that I could have done this differently. Do you regret not being part of the investment banking world? Do you regret that uh, 
you could not start something of your own despite having tried do you regret that uh, possibly some of your friends who are probably settled abroad who make a lot of more money than you uh, and you could have had that life see i think i think uh, life is it's a series of events right so there are uh, there are I, i think multiple parts that you can take but it's always one path that eventually will land up right and it's again as i said right it's it's it you can call it luck good luck or bad luck but it's always about the opportunities that you create which lead to that luck right so i think um there could be many regrets across careers maybe i should have got into a startup much earlier is something that i always thought about right maybe um should did did possibly i i see one or two startups and i thought are to idea i also had thought about why didn't i start up right so it's always about uh what you did not do but what you did mm-hmm. right i think that is more important and it's it's good to look at failures because you learn from those failures but it's not to be very like um, very attached to those ki yaar acha i could not achieve this right i think where i am i am today i'm very happy which is very important uh, looking at as you said right settling abroad i had those opportunities it was a conscious call because i wanted to be part of the industry story um, i just somehow i don't think i uh, would have flourished in a manner if i had been outside india right so it's all about the opportunities that people give you and you grab with both your hands um so no regrets as such big regrets yes uh, maybe certain things that i should have done earlier uh, i should have done earlier versus at at those kind of things because uh, and i think one thing that i have realized over the years maybe it's just uh, uh, working in in uh, across different parts of a company is that follow your gut feeling right and there have been situations where i've 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 I'm, i'm i'm about to join a company or about to do some kind of a transaction or a deal uh and uh, you're not getting the great flavor about right yeah. that there something is wrong yeah. and by while the numbers the everything on paper is looking great but you realize that nahi yaar something is not adding up but if, but you still go ahead with that and i've realized that my gut feeling is always telling me the right thing and it happens with people it's whether you call, some people call it six and some people call it um hidden information or whatever it is but i think you need to trust that beyond the numbers beyond what is there in front of your eyes sometimes and uh, i at least across many many failures i've realized that i should focus on uh, what what my gut is telling me to do uh right now my gut is telling that i need lunch <laughs> and i think we have spoken for a long long time thank you very much uh for giving us time i know you have a hard stop as well uh thank you very much for talking so candidly to us about the industries that you have been part of i'm sure this is going to help people who are uh, listening to us or probably have tuned in uh one last piece of advice that you want to leave our audience with uh who probably think that a particular job a particular sector a particular industry is going to set them up for life right and then reality hits them mm-hmm. when they probably are in it and are doing it and then they realize there is more to life than just earning a lot of money yeah no i think uh, very rightly said right i think it's it's important to be passionate about what you're doing if you are passionate or and you love what you're doing i think everything else will uh, set sail right i think um i think that is the most important thing to find your passion it should not be the case that uh, you are following a set path like for me i have i thought that i was following a set path but eventually turn of events landed somewhere else in bihar and never landed up and it turned out to be good for me right so uh, and i think the biggest thing that i uh, one of the things that i always heard is people asking this question right where do you see yourself 5 years from now right which is i think in today i think is the most ridiculous question okay. in everybody's life because i think you can only plan for the next 1 or 2 2 years because change is permanent so unless you are able to adapt to the kind of things that that are happening in the external environment uh, you you cannot you cannot survive right so i think it's important to be cognizant of what is uh, what is happening both externally but you need to also find your passionate path so failures will always be there it's always about rising from those failures uh, you may not have a job today but if you know that you are passionate about something you will find a way to make money so money is important but it should not be the end goal for any kind of uh, uh, purpose in life i like this coming from a guy who deals with <laughs> money 
ऑल द टाइम थैंक यू वेरी मच अनुभव थैंक यू फॉर शेयरिंग योर जर्नी शेयरिंग योर अनुभव विद अस अगेन दिस इज द थर्ड टाइम आई एम यूजिंग एंड आई एम नो आई फॉर अ फैक्ट दैट यू गोइंग टू किल मी बट डू टेल अस हाउ यू लाइक दिस पॉडकास्ट आई थरली एंजॉय दिस कॉन्वर्सेशन इज व्हाट आई कैन टेल यू ऑन कैमरा डू चेक आउट द काइंड ऑफ प्रोग्राम्स दैट वी हैव टू ऑफर ऑन ऑल ट्यूनी डू चेक आउट कोको एफ एम एज वेल एंड फाइंड द काइंड ऑफ स्टोरीज दैट यू रेजोनेट विद एंड these people work very hard to put uh do tell us which are other guests that you want to see in the conversations cafe podcast and we would try and bring them to our show thank you very much once again uh and i hope that you have a great flight uh anubhav back home and thank you enjoy you. your weekend thank you so much all the best to you guys thank you very much thank you.